Welcome to show Studio's fully digital live panel discussions in collaboration this season with Harrods. So very exciting. Um, for spring summer 21, experts from all part of the industry and beyond are gathering together um, uh, digitally. So we're sticking to social distancing rules um, to discuss and debate some of the most exciting brands of the season. And uh, this is a really exciting one for us because we have the opportunity to talk about Cipria Lele's Spring Summer 21 collection um, and a bit more about her work and beyond. Um, today was in theory meant to be the last day of London Fashion Week, but it actually is day two okay. of Milan. Um, but what, uh, before we get into the actual details of Cipria's collection, um, I'd like our fantastic panelists to introduce themselves, starting with you, Osman. Hi, my name is Osman Ahmed, and I am the Fashion Features Editor at ID Magazine. Diva? Hi, my name is Diva, and I'm a PhD student at the Department of History of Art at UCL here in London, and I work on uh, the history of photography in mid-20th century India. And Renura? Hi, um, I'm a final year fashion student on Central St. Martin's MA Fashion. Welcome to you three. Um, now, Supriya this season didn't have a show, so it's an interesting time, of course, everybody is discussing post or pre or during Corona, wherever we're at right now, um, different formats and different ways of showing collections. Um, Supriya released images of her new collection um, and did previews with journalists in London at her studio, um, which in itself I think is an interesting kind of thing to discuss, the, the, the almost lack of, of moving image when everybody else seems to be running towards making moving images, whether they should do or not is a different thing. Um, talking about the collection to Vogue, she said, I want the collection to feel optimistic while at the same time having some quite dark elements to it. We are uh, with so much uncertainty in the air, that's how I'm feeling and how a lot of people are feeling right now. Now what I've noticed is that of course the pressure to I guess frame any new collection being released right now against the backdrop of corona or the pandemic is huge, it's the, it's the kind of easiest thing to go to um, and it makes sense to do so but I wondered whether you felt that sense of darkness in these images that we can see now in the collection um, and whether this is a true reflection of the times um, that, that you're sensing as well. Osman what did you think? Um, well I'm, I'm not sure if I got darkness from it um... <laughs> But I, I, I think it felt very, very true to, to what she's been doing. It felt like she has reiterated a lot of the, 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 the kind of clothes that, that we've come to know her for. Um, you know, it's, it's quite sexy. Um, it's very streamlined. You know, there's a lot of the references that she's kind of gone back to, which you know, you could say that they're quite 90s or early 2000s. I know that she's very influenced by Helmut Lang. I, I can definitely see that. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I think that, you know, there are kind of two camps of designers and there are those that are kind of really addressing the world that we're living in. And there are the others that kind of want to offer a bit of escapism. But I think that Supriya within that as an independent designer is kind of just, you know, you have to remember she's, she's only been showing for a handful of seasons. She's still a very small label. So mm -hmm. I think it's just kind of establishing what she's about and, and pushing, pushing forwards with that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned that sexiness because she's also talked a little bit about the idea of being in, you know, sweatpants or comfy clothes, um, particularly her and, and the people that she works with. Um, and then slowly as they've come back into the studio, they've decided to dress up maybe a bit more because that whole act of dressing isn't just for oneself, it's for everybody else. So there's this kind of sense that she wanted to push more sexiness um, or push on a sort of more... I guess, uh, more dressed up sensibility, which is in line with what she's done before. Um, but do you get, does this look sexy to you, Diva, as a woman? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was actually going to say that I re I thought this idea of shooting the collection in front of a stair, in, in a stairwell is really, 
I think it's brave and I think it's important. I think it's the, it's a kind of, I was thinking it's sort of an anti-Instagram aesthetic. It's very true to where we all are at the moment. It captures that, that feeling of, you know, being all dressed up with nowhere to go and turning it on yourself and saying, well, then who do I dress up for? What am I, what is the purpose of adorning myself? Is it for someone else? Is it for me? Um, and then just thinking about the kinds of photographs in fashion archives, for example, they get relegated to being behind the scenes, the ones that are never supposed to be seen. I think there's something re really, really wonderful about the fact that what we would, pre we would have once thought of as being behind the scenes uh, images are actually what are being put out there. And it's in such stark contrast, for example, to the series uh, that she did with Jamie Hawksworth for one of her previous campaigns, which was so transporting. Um, I think in a way it would be really cruel to transport anyone anywhere right now. So that was really, I thought that was really brave. And yeah, I think it's, it's, it's very sexy. I think it really plays with ideas of concealing and revealing and what we see and what, what's kind of left to the imagination. I think it's, it's really alluring. Mm. And Renura, what do you make, particularly of these images here? Diva's mentioned the Autumn Winter 20 lookbook shot um, in India by mm. Jamie Hawksworth. What did you think of those images or what do you think of them now? I think what I find really interesting about her work is kind of how the sort of Western press perceive it, as opposed to if these images were taken, if these images were kind of reviewed by um, an Indian newspaper or kind of an, a pre the, the press over there. And I think I think these images again, like over here, they bring a sense of novelty um, because I feel like it's it's a kind of there's like a newness to it, and I feel like that brings a very different conversation. Whereas as as opposed to it being in India, whereas I think it's very commonplace. Um, so I think I think there's that kind of contrast with her and her, where she and and she can I think she can occupy those two spaces very well. Um, but I, I just I don't want it to kind of be seen as a novelty over here of what she's kind of doing in these images kind of, I, I feel like it's a lot of designers kind of going back to their kind of, um, back to where they're for, from and doing these kind of quite large photo essays. And I think that's become quite commonplace. Mm. Um, but I feel like working with Jamie Hawksworth, I think is a really nice way to kind of elevate her brand, I think. It yeah. brings a lot of kind of fashion, um, a kind of imagery to, to her, I think in a way. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I am particularly interested in the framing of Supriya as a British Asian designer. She's very conscious to um, call herself one of those in her press release, for example, and in, in most things that you read about her, she will be a British Asian designer. And in some ways that I find that, I mean, and this is probably a generational thing, I find that kind of quite uh, sad in a way because, you know, generationally, in terms of, you know, when I was a student 15, 20 years ago, you know, you would reject any of those labels. You'd reject any of the that sense of, I am from this place or my parents were born in this place. So therefore I am was defined by that. But we're living in a time now where designers and a, a, a generation, which Renura, you can tell me more about being a current student at somewhere like St. Martin's, mm -hmm. where actually your USP is all based around your DNA and, you know, kind of where your parents are from and even what their jobs are and where they've lived and all of these things that actually I think a generation before were asked to shed some of those and just be respected as a designer. So Priya I think is a fantastic designer but this added label of the British Asian designer I think does something different and I wondered what your thoughts were as a student. Are you constantly being asked to reflect your own culture whatever that might be in your work or are you now? I mean I know it's something that I've never really done. I've, I've, I've not found it very, like, I feel, I feel like where I'm from is so kind of normal to me that I've never really found it that interesting. Um, but I think more and more, I think, I think a lot of people are kind of using it as a form of relevancy in a way, or to make them seem a bit more interesting when, mm. when it really shouldn't be done like that. I think you could compare it to maybe how everyone was kind of calling themselves a sustainable designer a few, a few years ago or something. And it's, it's kind of using that, I don't know, it's just trying to find a point, point of difference in something when there's not really something that interesting going on. I think there's a lot of kind of, I've seen, you know, students referencing, you know, where they're from, but when you actually ask them, you know, like, did you grow up there? How many times have you visited your family over there? And it's sometimes just like, oh, I've, I've been twice in my adult life to like, you know, 
where they're from and it's a very kind of immediate way to kind of find some sort of faux kind of identity or relevancy I think to try and make their work look more interesting but I think again another maybe problem is that there's so very few um you could say British Asian designers within fashion education or kind of going through the art schools here and I think yeah I think that's quite sad in a way as well yeah so it's almost it feels like maybe this is a definition of a group of of, of people that haven't existed before in a sort of uh, wider known sense because of course I mean there have been people before but of course now we're living in an age where everybody has much more visibility which I think is good but just to stick with you for a second have you ever been asked to look at where you are from in the loosest terms by tutors or are you guided into doing that because I remember when I was uh, did my BA at St Martin's it was it was all anybody ever wanted from me and I grew up in Bedford <laughs> so they all wanted me to do things about India they all wanted me to do things about East Africa where my parents were born but you know my relationship to those places is is just as uh, surface as you know a British born white person yeah. so yeah, they, yeah. They, like I know more about those places so is that something you're encouraged to do or do you feel like that's changing? I feel like, you know, you're always asked to kind of make your work personal. And I, I guess you kind of, you obviously you just make work about what you know, really. But I, I think I've never really been asked to kind of directly, you know, reference. I'm from like, I was born in Sri Lanka, but I grew up over here. I've never really like been directly asked to kind of, it's never been like forced on me, um, which I think is a really good thing. And I think I've always kind of, you know, I think, you know my interest in say like a, a sculptor's work is far more I found that you know I could find that far more interesting than where I'm from in a way mm. um so I think I think it's kind of we have, we've always had the freedom to kind of do what do what we want which is, which is really good I think. That is good I'm glad to hear it. Osman what's your reaction to this kind of you know the idea of identity politics which I think is playing out across you know the world in lots and lots of different ways but in relation to fashion and in relation to Supriya What's your view on that? Um, well, I think there are a couple of things. I think on the first thing is that, uh, you know, as, a, as an industry, we've been talking about, uh, well, recently anyway, um, but I know some of us have been talking about it for longer, the need for, uh, for more perspectives um, of people who are not you know, kind of, who are not white British or come through a certain system or have a particular set of references. You know, we, we've we been talking about the need for designers from different places for, for wherever that may be. Um, and so I, I do think that it's wonderful that we we have that now. I mean, perhaps not as much as, as, as there could be, but definitely Supriya fits into this wider, I don't know if you could call it a movement, but definitely a group of predominantly female designers in London who are either second generation or first generation who are kind of exploring their, their cultural heritage. Um, but then I guess, I guess the other thing is that, you know, exploring identity, identity, the identity politics is the kind of body politic right now for young people it's 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 very much about that whether it's about race or gender or sexuality or um or any of those any of those things you know that is um i suppose it's the new subculture in a way um so it I, it makes sense that that a young generation of designers are going to be exploring it um in a literal sense um i i kind of wonder how much pressure they feel to to do that. I know having spoken to Supriya, for example, that she's had a lot of um, people tell her that she should put Sanskrit typography on, on her clothes and, and things like that, which just seems so outdated. Um, but the other thing is, I guess, you know, fashion is a really interesting example of, of this, but who who owns India, for example? Is it just Indian designers that can explore India? We've seen previously designers go to India and get inspiration and perhaps some of them um, assert stereotypes and cliches, perhaps other ones do it in a way that you wouldn't even notice what that reference is. Um, and I guess it, 
it fits into that wider conversation as well of, I suppose, people feel like you have to be from somewhere in order to explore it. And if you're not from that place, then you can't. So yeah. Supriya being from India, well, her family come from there, that it is her, her right, um, her prerogative to make work about India, um, which I think is a really interesting conversation. And maybe that's slightly problematic. I don't, I don't know. There is a whole policing of, of, I think, lots of things happening at the moment, a policing of culture, policing of thought, a policing of, you know, any view that doesn't necessarily go with the mainstream. And I think it, it's a really important space to have something like this or to have a kind of room to actually offend someone potentially. But what we're talking about is, I guess, yeah, I mean, cultural appropriation is such a big, big topic, but I think the assumption that I just think you can appropriate your own culture and does that somehow yeah. make that okay? Yeah. Diva, I wondered what you thought about this whole scenario and, and the thorny issue of, of cultural appropriation. I have, I'm conflicted on it. I think I understand, I mean, I think I should say first off that I'm the only, I imagine, non-diaspora person on this panel in that I'm South Asian from South Asia. So I, I grew up with a kind of majoritarianism uh, or majoritarian arrogance, let's say, um, that I imagine makes my perspective on this maybe a little different, but I'm not sure I believe that anyone is an inherent carrier of a body of knowledge. Um, I think that that comes out of research and I think you can feel a, a huge amount of kinship with you know, the aesthetics or the visual culture of a particular region, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to be from there or your family has to be from there in order to get it. Um, so I find this whole question really interesting, but I do find, and I don't know maybe how Ran feels about this, but I'm fine. I'm, I'm very happy that we're in a global climate right now where people are able to express their identities and the diversity of their identity. What makes me a little less comfortable is when uh, causality is applied to your identity. And so is Supriya doing this particular thing in her design because she is Indian or of Indian extraction? Is it, is it, does it have to all go back to that is kind of what makes me, makes me anxious. Um, but other than that, I think it's a really beautiful thing to see how diverse we are now or the way that that diversity is coming to the fore and people mm -hmm. are allowed to try different things and play with kind of different aspects of their lives. I think that's wonderful. And could you see that kind of South Asian language, I guess, in her clothes? Can you spot that? Yeah, but in, in, a, in a very unlikely way, I have to say, I think that looking through her whole over has been really, it's quite playful and it's not direct. And I found it to be there in kind of whispers um, and implications, but never explicit. And so you get it in, there are shadows of it in the way that her clothes are cut. I'm reminded of saris, but it's not explicit. And it's far from that kind of Sanskrit Om t-shirt that tourists pick up in a, you know, at a, whatever, at the welcome point of some tourist hotel in Varanasi. It's not that at all. It's something, it's interesting. I mean, looking at just the reference image that we're looking at, which is um, Whereabout, which is a blog that Manu started a while ago. Um, you're looking at layers, the way she's playing with the fact that a particular layer of a garment may, may cover or conceal something, but then the other layer you put on top of it might reveal something. Uh, just the way the angles of the clothing and this is men's fashion, obviously, but I, I'm not. I'm not saying I see a direct translation or a direct lifting and applying. I find that to be really base. But I think that there's a kind of playfulness with which you can see how some of that seems to arrive in this, um, and it's not literal, but yeah. it's imaginative. Yeah, yeah. I think what's exciting though is that there is this kind of. I think so many of us, our view on other parts of the world is so controlled by what you know the education we've had, where what we've been told in school, as we've seen with the Black Lives Matter 
um, movement and with statues being reassessed across the world, you know, the, con the recontextualizing of these things that we just have assumed are always the same. I think one of my frustrations, I think, with a lot of, you know, um, Indian things growing up in the UK in particular, is that there is, you know, we have this very singular BBC view of India, which is very much like the pictures that Jamie actually took for Autumn Winter 20, which is why I don't, I'm not mad on them. He's a, a wonderful photographer. These are beautiful clothes. The, the girls are beautiful. So it works as Runa was saying it's these are incredible images but in terms of pushing anything forward it doesn't do that it feels quite um dated in a, in a way but I, what I'm interested in actually as you were talking is that the reference of uh saris for example I think people globally or particularly sorry I mean in the UK have this sense of you know Indians being very conservative and them being very kind of shy of the body and shy of sex and not talking about um, these sorts of things. But there's there's such an inherent deep sensuality about the sari as a garment and the draping of and the sheerness of, you know, these fabrics on a, on a body. And I think there's something that really, that Supriya really pulls out in that. And then she takes it to, you know, a Tom Ford Gucci 90s reference or a Helmut Lang reference. So you've got that kind of meeting of the two, which I guess is the meeting of a British person who happens to be, you know, Indian also. So there is that kind of eats meets West tag that was, uh, that one should always avoid saying, even though I've just said mm. it. Um, there's something kind of interesting in that reassessment of what it means to wear Indian clothes or what it means to be an Indian woman. So in that there is something, but Osman, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I wanted to say, because to your point earlier, you know, you were talking about when you were a student and perhaps it was demanded of you, but also I think a certain generation of British Asians anyway, you know, perhaps have kind of avoided their cultural heritage in that they just want to be taken seriously as whatever they are, whether it's a designer or a photographer, a writer. And I think that Supriya is the first person to tell you that when she was growing up, she was really embarrassed of wearing a sari, um, you know, and, and that I think she just wanted to wear t-shirts and jeans. And, you know, the sari is a garment that kind of is worn by, when you think about it, women of all ages. It, it, it's, it's kind of a difficult, um, a difficult garment to make your own in that, I suppose, traditional dress is, it kind of speaks for you about who you are. It's it's kind of, when you're young, you know, perhaps there's a subculture thing, perhaps you're a bit more goth, perhaps you're a bit more whatever. It's it's difficult to make a traditional piece of clothing express your, your individuality. And I think that as she has kind of gotten older and perhaps has started to explore how she feels about her, her heritage, and I don't think she's embarrassed about it anymore, but I think that she's kind of unpacking what that um, that cultural schizophrenia, which is, I think it was Mira Sael that coined that term, that a lot of British Asians feel um, growing up, which is you are kind of straddling, I suppose, two worlds. And, and there, there is kind of a weird uh, sense of uh, reparation or, I don't know, guilt or um, discovery that comes with, with seeing things with a fresh perspective when you're older rather than when you're younger, if that makes sense. I think there is still that struggle though. I mean, Ranura, is there that generational struggle to kind of deal with these two things or is it all quite kind of sound? It's fine, it's not a big deal. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 think, I think it's all fine. <laughs> like, you know, I think, yeah, I just feel like you kind of, I think you just, you just take it as it comes in a way and you kind of like just, embrace it and I think like I, I really like I can kind of really agree or kind of I can kind of really see why I can relate to how she kind of felt quite embarrassed by her, her culture when she was younger in a way um but I think that's just you know a part of growing up and kind of just you know you become more comfortable with things as you just get older and kind of you can really use your kind of those quirks and kind of things that you know I think growing up here like you can you can either sometimes you know you can really be the only like South Asian person in your school or kind of you know um especially outside of London for sure I think that's really possible and I think I think yeah you can re just really embrace it now I think as you as you grow older. Um, how important do you think it is as a, as a designer a young designer 
to that visibility, like seeing somebody. And Mo Osman earlier mentioned that Supriya is part of this generation of, of young female women, of female women, women of color designers. So you were talking, I guess, about Bianca Saunders, Priya Aluwalia, Moa Lola. So there is a kind of a coterie of these, you know, fantastically spirited, talented women that are very much leaning into their um, cultural identities in a way that maybe my generation would have shied away from. Um, and I think that in itself is quite powerful. But I wondered what, Ran, you thought, how important is it to, to see that? Is that a hopeful message? Is it an important one? Definitely. I think I think it's really important. I think, um, you know, regardless, even, even if you're not you know, explicitly referencing, referencing your heritage, but just mm -hmm. seeing more designers of color, I think is really important, especially for, I guess for like younger kind of, um, a, a generation kind of below us or like below me, I think, I think that's really important. Cause I, I never really had that. And I, I've only just like, you know, I think there's not much of a generational difference or like a, a much of an age gap, but I don't think when I was first, you know, starting out on my BA, for example, there were really many South Asian designers that I could sort of look up towards in a way and I feel like Supriya is kind of there and she's kind of um you know so I give her a lot of kind of credit for that in a way and I think I really admire her in that sense that she's kind of the first to kind of do it really in a way yeah. and have all of these references and kind of um but that again like I, I just really worry that because she is the first kind of you know there's not first to kind of say let's look at this idea of like you know being inspired by by her mother saris and so on because she's the first I just worry that I don't, I don't want her just to be known for that in a way. And I think you kind of, it can be so easy to kind of pigeonhole someone just because she's kind of really pioneering and doing it. But yeah, I just kind of worry about that a bit. Yeah, you don't, you don't want it to become a blueprint for, okay, everybody has to be like this, which is, yeah. is, 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 is the paradox of the fashion industry is that, you know, we do ask for newness and we do ask for diversity but then once we get it, a little bit of it, we just want that again and again and again. And I think um, that that is something that I don't, I, you know, there is no answer to that. But I think it's very important that you're absolutely right that, but not only as designers, I think there needs to be more voices that are also diverse talking about this stuff. Because, you know, I mentioned, um, one of you mentioned at the beginning, you know, somebody else looking at one of her collections. I remember uh, uh, even on Show Studio, Georgie and I, after her show two seasons ago, did a quick in the car review. And all of the colors from that collection just reminded me of a, a Bollywood film that I'd watched as when I was like 10 or 11. And they were, you know, I could, all that 90s Bollywood kind of, you know, the stonewashed denim, these are clothes that everybody was wearing, but in India, in that context, they were sort of changed. And for somebody growing up here, you looked at them slightly differently, which actually led me to what I wanted to ask you, Diva. How different is this conversation about identity politics when you are someone like yourself, born in India, grown up in India, and then moved here? Do these kind of questions still exist or are they not, are they not there? I think I had, I've had to battle with them much less, if that makes sense. I think that, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of Supriya kind of wanting to listen to punk music as a teen and the expectations being cast on her being different. And I think there's something, um, there's something about growing up in the same place as the kind of where, you know, being a dominant ethnicity, let's say, and, and I came with all kinds of additional privileges in terms of caste and like growing up in a city um, where those kinds of fluidities were really allowed. And so I think I, I, you grew up kind of already rejecting whatever you wanted to reject really in a way. It wasn't because it was kind of dominant, it could be questioned and there were all kinds of subcultures within it. Um, something that I was thinking of that, that really appealed to me about Supriya's clothing in general, um, not just this collection, but previous ones, is that she's not, she's taking up a really nuanced, I mean, there, there are these kinds of homages to, to Indian textiles, but it's not just the sari, it's not this kind of tourist, version of Indian clothing. She's looking at and she's taking apart and she's deconstructing what Indian clothing or South Asian clothing can be. She's looking at drawstrings. She's looking at kamar buns. She's looking at cholis, which were these, you know, late 19th century blouses uh, that were very different from the kinds of Victorian blouses that the ladies wore. They were, you know, they just about covered the bust. 
um, and you still see them worn in particular communities in, in the, on the western part of the, uh, of the coast. Um, and so I think that there's something, I think, I mean, just as for me, having really, I guess, been saturated in a particular kind of a visual culture surrounding India and having grown up in India, uh, what I value here, what I appreciate here is that it's not a marketized, um, Bollywoodized necessarily version. It's not, it's, it's, it's interesting, it's um, analytical, it's geometrical. Geometry is not often associated with South Asian visual culture, for example, you often get, you know, this idea that it's these, you know, blank pieces of, of loud color and everything is red and yellow and everything is happy and dancey. And that's not what's going on here. So, I mean, I, I, I have to say I, have, I really appreciate it because I think it does a great justice in conversing with the region without essentializing it. Mm. Um. There were, I think, uh, you know, some of the Czechs, for example, are coming from a particular, I think it is, it is a Madras Czech. Um, so some of the textiles are actually directly taken from uh, India, but actually they're not necessarily immediately recognizable to everybody as being Indian. I mean, I keep thinking about a collection that John Galliano did, I think for Dior, where it was, um, was inspired by India. I mean, of course, everybody has been inspired by India, but uh, you can all imagine what that collection looked like. You know, it was very much all of the bits that, you know, but also the bits that we should necessarily shy away from, but they're the bits that maybe people feel like they they understand from National Geographic. So there is this kind of much more, you're absolutely right, modern nuanced take on all of these different identities that any young person working in the fashion industry, working in London is having to kind of juggle with. And I guess so many of them play out in the clothes and in the collections that she's done. I mean, these Galeanos are incredibly fantastical and part of me wishes clothes like that still existed. Um, I think we need them after Corona, during Corona. I don't know where we are with Corona again, but there's there's that fantasy element that a, on, a, on a larger topic, I think has been drained out of fashion. Um, and I think with the sexiness, the sensuality that Supriya is talking about and that she's given in this new collection, there is that sense of the body being present again in it after a six month period of us not really dressing for anybody, not really noticing anybody. I mean, Osman, you wrote a story about the point of fashion shows. What do you think is interesting here in, in the fact that there is no moving image content, that Supriya has not made anything, she's not kind of done a quick three minute video like everybody else has done. Do you think that's a pointed decision or does it, you know, what does it tell us about her as a, as a designer? Um, well, maybe, maybe it is, maybe it's just about the clothes. I mean, you know, the images that we're looking at, the, I, I, I've been to her studio before and I'm pretty sure that it's the staircase in her studio. So I yeah. think it was all kind of done in that, in that building. Um, I, I think that it, it, it if anything, it, it, to me, it says, here is a collection that was probably very hard to make because I, in London, studios were closed compared to Milan and Paris where every, everything was able to reopen earlier. Um, I'm, I imagine that all of these clothes have been made in the studio rather than being made with the factory. Um, as a lot of factories have remained closed. I think it, it if anything, it, it it strips it back to to something quite pure but um and and i i really love that because i think that you know the fact that we can talk about this collection at length without having to have a video or a you know a massive show production is is testament to the fact that there is there is great content there for for want of a better word um but I and I, I I don't know. I'd be really interested to. That said, I'd be interested to see her do a video. I would love to see that. I I really like what she does with Jamie Hawksworth. I I'm sure that she'll they'll do something together for this. But um, but it isn't necessary. I suppose we're all looking at fashion with different eyes at the moment and. I think with these clothes, a lot of women are looking at them and thinking, well, I'd really like to wear that. Or, 
you know, perhaps that would look good. It looks good on the body. The girls look great. Um, it has a sense of ease there, but also a sense of sen a sensuality and a, and a sexiness. Um, you know, there are, there are some designers that feel the need to kind of do the big productions and the, mm. the video, the, you know, kind of music video or whatever it is. But I think sometimes that um, is because there isn't much to look at with the clothes. So they, they could be, you know, a, a distraction. Yeah. 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 I mean, there is winner ago. Uh, no, I was going to say, I just have a question. Do you guys know if she has any stockists in India? Almost, like, I think that would be like really interesting to kind of see how. We should find out. No. Um, <laughs> that's really interesting. Because you know, if you're like a twenty-something-year-old living in, I don't know, like Mumbai at the moment. I do you know. know do you know about Supriya? Are you wanting to wear her? And I think I really hope so. <laughs> What's interesting to me is that kind of because you know there is there is a Vogue India, there are magazines in India, there is a whole fashion industry mm. there. Let's not forget, um, there are designers that have been working in India for, for for probably as long as we've been alive. But I think I know a few celebrities have worn her work. None of them are Indian. Okay, Dua Lipa and. <laughs> And I do think that a, a friend of mine who's a buyer was telling me um, that in Dover Street Market, in the basement, which is where I think her collections used to be, that she was one of the best selling brands. I don't think that it's Indian people going in there and no, buying. No, no, no. I also yeah. think, I think that, and this is probably testament to her ability to kind of work with those references in a really effortless way, yeah. in a nuanced way, is that when you're looking at the clothes on a rail, I don't think you see a sari or see exactly, a chori yeah. or a debata or whatever it is. I think you, you're you just seeing kind of dress that you want to wear on your 25th birthday, like Dua Lipa did. <laughs> no, I, I really agree with that. I have to say, I think that her use of, she doesn't lift India, she cites it. And I think there's a really, elegant difference between the two things. One stereotypes, the other respects um, and has a kind of mature relationship with. I don't think that she's derivative. I think she's really clever in what she's doing. Um, I don't know, actually, I'd be curious to know more about <laughs> whether it's popular in India. The Indian Vogue thing is a really interesting one because if I remember correctly, there was a controversy a few years ago where Mario Testino did the, the Vogue India shoot with Kendall Jenner. And they were marketing this really dreamy, like Maharaja ridden aesthetic of India to the Indians. Um, I don't know if that's because the assumption is we like it. If people do, in fact, if I'm the only one who finds it tired, I don't, which I doubt, but I think that the question of how India is produced to Indians is itself like another different and very fraught issue that maybe deserves its own kind of moment of reflection. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't say that whether or not the clothes show up in, in Vogue India is, is telling of anything. Yes. <laughs> but I imagine they have already. I mean, I'd be curious to know. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe. But it's even in our discussion, isn't it interesting that we we would expect that to happen? Like somehow by these working in India, it would almost be another kind of thumbs up, whereas they cannot be individually um, away from that continent. Just great clothes. We still want that kind of sign, not a sign of approval, but you still you still want to kind of understand, well, do we, are Indians going to wear this? And we still kind of have that tendency to just lump everybody together. Yeah. And I wonder, if, again, maybe that's, that's part of that thinking that maybe we need to break. I, I definitely see Supriya as a British designer. Mm. You know, I, I think that more of her references are, are Western and, and British um, as a girl growing up in Birmingham than they are Indian. Um, so I, I, and I don't know, I, I, I really, I think actually thinking back, I remember the graduate collection that she was a part of um, at the RCA and I remember being there and that first collection that, you know that, that was the collection she did as a student was a lot more Indian I mean the girls had you know the tickers and everything it was it, there was the jewelry etc mm -hmm. um, 
and kind of as as she's kind of progressed and grown as a designer she um she seems to kind of have you know let I, I don't know it's less obvious it's worn more lightly um and I th I hope that that continues in a way because I don't think that she should have to carry the heavy burden of being the first British Asian <laughs> Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, or you know, I, I really like that. I really like the idea of um, someone just going to a wedding in India in one of her like you know drapery kind of dresses and just upsetting all the aunties at the wedding, which is kind of, of course like, really funny. Although Indian wedding fashion has become quite different from its, it's become pretty. I mean, I find this interesting because I do think that people are taking way more risks on the Indian fashion scene than they were maybe allowed to. Um, a while ago, you've suddenly got the deep cleavage sari blouse, um, you know, without or you know, for the lehenga, without the chunni, can you imagine the horror that would have inflicted 10 years ago and it doesn't anymore. So it's it's yeah. funny, I would love to see some of this um, over there. Yeah, I think it's pretty great. But you're right, <laughs> you don't want her to be oppressed by that label. Mm. You know, it's something that's always attributed to um, non-Euro-American, designers there's always this mood board that has to go with someone's work and I find that itself to be a kind of burden. Mm -hmm. I, I also find it interesting because it's a question of context isn't it because if these clothes were if someone for example did wear it to a wedding in India how many other guests at that wedding would be able to tell that it's by a designer of Indian origin? I don't think that many would kind of say, oh, yes, there's the darting of a sari there, or, you know, the, oh, yes, it's asymmetrical or whatever. I think that in India, it's exotic. In, in Britain, it's exotic. Um, it kind of doesn't fall neatly into either category. Well, therein lies a great place to stop and a great challenge to our viewers, particularly any of them in India, to wear a Supriya Lele outfit <laughs> to a wedding and to send us a picture. That would be very greatly appreciated. Um, thank you, wonderful panelists. That was super enlightening. And I feel like it's a bigger conversation that hopefully we can have again um, or we can have online with you. So um, make sure you do uh, pop to the fifth floor of Harrods to check out more show studio coverage. Um, and make sure you're subscribing to the YouTube channel. Please do comment, send us your thoughts below. Um, and thanks again to everybody. Have a great evening. <laughs>